Welcome back, inebriates. Uh, this is Andy, as always. Um, if you remember, again, I think it was about a year and a half, maybe as long as two years ago, uh, we had the crew from Monster Talk on the show because um, I'm a big fan of their shows. If you haven't checked out uh, Monster Talk, listen to this and then go check it out. Um, but uh, recently they had a guest on, and Fish, our producer and editor, is a big fan of this particular, uh, now our guest, too. But um, Pat Spain, um, TV show host, uh, author, cryptozoologist extraordinaire. Welcome to the show, man. Hey, thanks so much for having me. No problem. Um, so, yeah, you have a very, like, I can't imagine. What does this say on your business card when you pass it out? <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. Um, so I've been remote for the last three years, so I haven't had an updated business card <laughs> since then. But uh, usually I tell people that I have a few jobs. <laughs> Yeah. When uh when you're at like the kids' school and you're doing the meet and greet with the other dads who mm-hmm. I very rarely have anything to talk about with. Um yeah, I, I usually say I have a few different jobs. I work in biotech, that's that that's my day job, that's what pays the bills. And then I do um wildlife adventure and crypto TV programs. And they go, Crypto, I'm like, not the kind you're thinking of. <laughs> yeah, it's, I don't know anything about blockchain. Yeah, I, I know absolutely nothing about that. <laughs> I would be driving a much different car if I knew about blockchain. Yeah, that that's funny because that is literally one of the things. Uh, when COVID hit, I got laid off from my day job. And now I do Nebri art full time. And uh, people will ask me and they'll be like, oh, you know, I'll meet someone new. And they'll be like, what do you do for a living? And you're like, uh, where am uh, I going to go with this? Yeah, I don't even yeah. know how to start to explain that to you. How the, long do I want to have this conversation? <laughs> the funny thing is, it's, it's you get two kinds of people. You get people who just kind of like, oh, okay, and go about whatever. And then you get other people who are fascinated that you have that kind of atypical job that most people don't have. And then they want to start. I mean, they tend to ask you like really stupid questions like, oh, are you going to get a real job at some point? You're like, it is a real, I work harder <laughs> it, than it a lot. A, <laughs> yeah. yeah. To get this, I was working 80 hours a week in a biotech lab, 70, 70 to 80 hours a week in a biotech lab. And then doing another 40 hours that I wasn't getting paid for. <laughs> in right. Fact, I yeah. was paying yeah. to do it. Um, I spent a crazy amount of money to, um, to, you know, for get the first show that I did, but yeah. I love it. It's just, it's super fun. It's a passion. It's something I've always wanted to do. And uh, yeah, but it does, it does lead to some really interesting party conversations. What was it that got you into cryptids in the first place? I feel like living around here, was it like a puck wedgie thing or? Oh yeah. You're, you're a mass hole also. Oh yeah. Right? Hell yeah. yeah. So um, I grew up in upstate New York actually. So I oh, moved here in was it like uh, 90. Uh, so, yeah, yeah, definitely. Yeah. I was, yeah. So I was fascinated. I think every kid, when you get like the scholastic book fair, um, mm-hmm. at least most kids that I was friends with bought a book on Bigfoot. It was like, you oh, see sure. that and you're like, Oh shit, there's a giant monkey out there. Like, I want to know more about this. Let me find it. So you're, you know, like seven years old when you do that. And then most kids kind of leave that after they're about like eight or nine, they're kind mm-hmm. of done with that. And they've gone on to something else. I never left it. I was just fascinated by every animal that you could possibly mention. When you start talking about cryptids, that really draws me in because I was always drawn to the weirder creatures anyway, like the deep sea stuff. I wanted to know about giant squid. I wanted to know about bats. I wanted to know about um, the eye eye and, uh, you know, kind of all oh, just the... uh, Madagascar, right? Yeah yeah yeah, yeah. 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 And just like the weirdest things, you know, that's why um, that one of the legends uh, they, they have it associated with. Um, that's why the middle finger is considered an insult in that region of the world, because the eye eyes yeah. have a super long middle right. finger. Yeah. And if they point it at you, it's supposed to be like a threat like you're uh or like a curse you know they they have some kind of mystical power so oh, that's interesting so all yeah. these weird animals I, I i loved and then i wanted to and then cryptids were like the weirdest of the weird so and, and the fact that some of them had actually been discovered you know like the giant squid started out as a cryptid and the okapi yeah. and even the gorilla um so yeah that was that was the intro to me and then uh, i just kind of I, I went to school for marine bio and i never stopped just being curious yeah, you know, it's like I remember when I was little, my interest in that sort of thing started with like Ripley's Believe It or Not. Yeah. And it was fascinating because it was history and it was macabre. And like, I still have those interests. And, you know, it has grown from 
that like, ooh, vampires are cool to where and partly why I like Moss Jock so much. Like, where did the idea of vampires come from and how does it affect you know modern day life and and kind of everything in between and so i've always had like that fascination with pseudoscience and actual science and you know it's it's just weird and interesting like i, I yeah you know we, we uh, did an episode on vampires in uh, on legend hunter for travel yeah. channel and i pitched it that it was my idea to do this episode because new england has this fascinating history with vampires that has been oh, kind that's of right. overlooked. Yeah yeah, 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 like the Mercy Brown stuff. And, mm -hmm. uh, you know, uh, Bram Stoker actually read a, a news story about New England vampires before he wrote Dracula. Oh, no kidding. So it's this whole, like, this whole weird connection. And I had this whole biological angle that, unfortunately, we weren't able to explore on the show. But um, TB, so tuberculosis, is, is what's almost certainly at the basis of a lot of the vampire myths in new england mm -hmm. and um we we like people brought that over from the old world but seals also um are can be a carrier for tb and there were some theories the musician that, no yeah <laughs> i know nothing about the guy i'm not going to start that rumor at all <laughs> But uh, so we were trying to get all these other marine biologists and no one really wanted to go on camera to talk about vampires and seals and any type of mix that you could have there. And also um, it's unfortunately led to a lot of kind of ignorance around and people ki killing seals thinking that they were going to spread disease and that that wasn't the angle that we wanted to take. But I had this whole cool theory about how, you know, the legend of vampirism came over from the old world to the new world and so did seals at the same time and so did this you know disease and all these other things and it it we ended up doing what i think is a really good show on it but we didn't get to bring in any of the biology of it instead yeah. i went down in new orleans and hung out with some vampires well that sounds pretty dope <laughs> <It was. laughs> yeah. one of my favorite cities so it was a good time yeah that's in we're just now getting to that point where we're getting to experience some really cool things. Like we're going out to Vegas for our second time. Um, but that idea of like getting to travel and explore new places and he'd be like, every once in a while I have to like nudge my producer fish and be like, Hey man, you know, just remember we're working right now. This is ridiculous. Yeah. Yeah. One of our producers had this great quote on um, this guy, Ben, who's just hysterical. And he said, the coolest thing about our job is he goes, I get to read about someone who does something really interesting and I get to call them on the phone and say, hey, can I go do this with you for a few days? And they almost always say yes. Yeah. What was like Some, your favorite experience like that? It. Oh, um, I got to go a thousand feet down in a sub, in a three-man sub. Ooh, cool. A thousand feet. And I'm a marine biologist. So I, I just totally like I was a complete nerd. And yeah. um, I was babbling incoherently to the driver of the sub, to the pilot. And I just couldn't wait to actually experience this. That was something I'd wanted to do since I was a little kid. And it was the coolest thing I've ever done. I feel like that would make me like, I'm usually pretty even keeled, but I feel like that would make me real. The idea that there's like, if the same thing with, with being in outer space, if something goes wrong, that's it. You'd like, oh, yeah. so that that's uh it's got to be pretty nerve wracking. How, how to be well, was that local here? Or like, no, that was out yeah. in uh, British Columbia, out okay. in, off Vancouver. Yeah, we I wasn't were down sure that's like for... a Woods Hole thing. Oh no, I love that place though. I did get to go there. I went to Woods Hole, and um, I actually so we did the first ever scan, um, like cat scan on an oarfish. And oh. an oarfish, yeah, they're they're they get huge. It's the largest bony fish, and mm -hmm. they are um, behind a lot of the sea uh, sea serpent legends and, and sightings. So we did the first ever CAT scan on one and we had this preserved specimen that was about 14 or 16 feet long. And it was um, laid out on the table and the producers kept on asking me to get closer to it, like lean down, lean down, lean down. So I'm leaning over this oarfish. And after about 10 minutes of doing that, I started just acting goofy. And I was like, you know, t t like touching its mouth. And I was going, blub, blub, blub. <laughs> like, Pat, what's happening? I was like, I don't know, man. This guy's weird. And the guy who who owned the fish, he came in. He goes, how long has he been like that? I'm like, I don't know, a couple minutes. He goes, he's drunk. Okay. What? The oarfish had been preserved in ethanol. And I was in a closed <laughs> space leaning over it. <laughs> That's awesome. So that was that was my woods hole experience. I got to get drunk off of a uh, off or fish. <laughs> <laughs> that's amazing. Um, that's so cool. So I gotta ask. So you have a bunch. You have a bunch of books out, right? You have six. Um, 
six books little bigfoot and bulletproof this- ground sloth and the one the one that i remember you talking about uh was about the mongolian death worm but then like i read the subtitle is how i found the worst bathroom on earth and learned to love cheese flavored vodka can you explain what the hell that means yeah so every one of the subtitles of the book is a little homage to dr strange love so oh, okay. uh, you know dr strange love or how i learned to study it so yeah. um so every one of my subtitles i i thought i'd go with the you know, like the attention grabbing kind of headline, but then gives you a flavor of what the book is going to be. And it's kind of my dark and weird sense of humor. Yeah. So while we were in Mongolia, um, we stayed in this, like people say in the middle of nowhere. And, you know, like that where I grew up in upstate New York, people would be like, oh, it's the middle of nowhere. I was literally in the middle of nowhere <laughs> in the Gobi Desert. There are no roads that lead to this town. It's just desert all around you. And then all of a sudden you come up over a ridge and there's this loosely, you know, square town in there. And um, there's no electricity or there was like one building that had electricity. There was one building that had running water and we were not in it. Yeah. So we're staying in this place and um, it was amazing. I mean, just such a cool experience. But we got there on the day of the biggest festival in Mongolia which is um, it's the fest, the, the three games of men. <laughs> and yeah. Yeah. The Nadam festival. Okay. So uh, this, in this one town, nomads just come from all over from hundreds of miles away and they congregate in this town. I mean, they always congregate in the nearest town Yeah, and they have um, three competitions, horseback riding, archery and wrestling. And um, all of them involve a lot of drinking. <laughs> and and eating really really bizarre things like tons of horse meat lots of goat knuckles um lots of fermented mare's milk which is just disgusting that's like terrible oh yeah it's served warm it's salty it's um oh it's just it's really gross and our guide excitedly tells me oh there's a drinking game that we can play i'm like yeah man i'm down how what do you do he goes, well, you draw a line in the sand and, you know, you're, you and your friend stand there and you drink mare's milk until one of you throws up and you have to throw up over the line. Like, I don't, <laughs> I think I'm missing something. I don't know how that's a game. How Is do you like win? <laughs> the, the last one to puke wins? And he's like, yeah. no. Like, then who wins? He's like, it's a game. I'm like, I don't understand. <laughs> So, so anyway, this is just setting where we are in the festival. So, so this festival happens. Um, I do traditional Mongolian wrestling. I get my ass absolutely handed to me. Um, I get just destroyed, thrown down to the ground by this huge, enormous Mongolian man. The announcer comes on and says, uh, the American doesn't think he's done his best. So we're going to have him wrestle a child. (laughs) (laughs) I then proceed to get beaten by a child. How did that go, Pat? Were they at least like a teenager? They were, right. um, they were, and I think he was actually like 16, but he was big and he did beat me really, really bad. Yeah. Um, so then there's, there's, um, the desert all around you, but there is one bathroom, which is like a long drop style. So it's this, uh, you know, just kind of, uh, wooden structure. And then there's a tire next to it and the tire is for peeing and the <laughs> long drop within there is, is for anything else. Um, And I mean, anything else. (laughs) So after eating goat knuckles and drinking fermented mare's milk and, you know, drinking some vodka and eating uh, what turned out to be hoisin sauce that had expired six years ago. Oh, oh, yeah. Um, (laughs) I I woke up in the middle of the night and had a little bit of an emergency. (laughs) I bet. So so I run down. um, There's not there's no bathrooms in the place where we're staying. So I run outside and I run over to the outhouse. And when I opened the door. It was a scene out of hell. It was, <laughs> there had been thousands of nomads gathered in this place where there is one bathroom. I mean, the floors were slick with every bodily fluid you can think oh, of. There were things my... dripping off the ceiling. Oh <laughs> my God. You stepped in and like liquid just squelched up through the floorboards. And it was Oof. like, uh, it was it was horrendous. So the entire crew have had a running joke about how this was the absolute most horrific bathroom that any of us had ever experienced and it, it makes concert uh porta potties not seem so bad oh man there's nothing nothing i've been a lot of different places and my my wife's favorite stories from my travels are all the bathroom stories and <laughs> nothing can compare to that oh there was someone 
I can't remember where I saw it. Someone did like a photo study. I want to say it was like bathrooms through Ireland. That and would make sense. Yeah. And it's just like this fascinating, like, you start thinking about like, yeah, I've been to some like interesting bathrooms before. You know, I was at, there's a, a brewery in Taunton, Mass. Mm-hmm. And their urinals are fashioned out of kegs. All right. That's kind of cool. Yeah. You know, yeah. I mean, it's not disgusting, but you know, I've had some, some run-ins where you're like, Ooh, Oh, Watch man. my hands because I am the cleanest thing in this place. <laughs> a, a whole bunch of places in uh, the Central African Republic, you'd go in and it would be like, you know, a public bathroom where there's four or five stalls, but there'd be one toilet seat that's left outside of the stalls. So if you need it, you grab the <laughs> toilet seat and you bring it in with you into the stall. That's and so... by stall, I mean just like two walls. There's no door. There's no door. <laughs> wow. Yeah, you get used to it real quick. Yeah. So, um, yeah, you don't you must not be a, a shy peer at all. I, I stayed at a, a pygmy, a, a village of um, Bayaka, no, Baca, the Baca pygmy tribes in um, in Cameroon. And the kids, I was the first um, Westerner that they'd ever seen. So it was like fascinating. Everything I did was fascinating. It was just like anything I ate, anything I drank, they wanted to try. They wanted to see what it was like. And super early in the morning, they wanted to just be right next to me while I was going to the bathroom, <laughs> like, <laughs> like uncomfortably close. Yeah. And then I'm sitting there like squatting down, you know, doing what I, and they're handing me things and like touching my hair. And I was like, please, this is so wrong. <laughs> <laughs> so, I was so like, oh weird. God, just back off of, but you know, I was the only one who thought it was weird. Everyone there thought it was totally fine. So how, how did you go from being you know, like a, a, a biologist to like, did you pitch the show? Did they come to you? Like, how does that happen? Yeah. So, um, so I auditioned for a reality show on animal planet, um, which involved driving from Boston to Ohio, just kind of on a whim and staying with uh, one friend of a friend and then some strangers. And okay. I ended up getting this reality show and finishing in second place, which is the first loser. But um, but I made some really good connections and I wanted yeah. to do this more. I said, I, I really want to do wildlife shows. Um, and Animal Planet said they were interested, but didn't want to pay me. So I got my own crew, to, which <laughs> is fine. I mean, so, so I is got it? my own crew together. <laughs> and I started making my own wildlife show and putting it up on YouTube. And I okay. did that for about six years. And while I was doing that, I um, I filmed a couple pilots here and there. So, you know, Animal Planet, BBC, Sci-Fi, um, like different places would call. Or, they, or a production company would say, we're looking for a host. We saw your YouTube stuff. Like, how about you try this? And um, after six years of doing that, I got Icon Films, who are the ones that make uh, River Monsters and Survive mm-hmm. the Tribe. And they're just amazing. They were my favorite production company and like my dream job. And they're the ones that called me and said, hey, we have this show that we're working on with National Geographic, but we need a host. Um, We've seen your stuff. We know that you're a biologist. What do you know about cryptozoology? I was like, oh, cool. So I started (laughs) spouting off some facts. And they said, well, we've got this angle that we want to do. Have you ever heard of this guy, Charles Fort? And I went, that's actually my great uncle. Oh, that's cool. And they went, no, shit, you need to do this (laughs) show. Absolutely. So, uh, and and then, yeah, I went down to DC. I met with Nat Geo a few times and we ended up making it happen. That's so cool. Yeah. So our, the thing that I love about monster talk and I have to keep bringing them up because that's how I was introduced to you. Um, but is they're they're very, uh, uh, skeptical approach to, you know, it's not just like, oh, there's Bigfoot. It's like, we don't believe that there's Bigfoot, but it's more interesting of like sociology wise, how it came to be. And but and there's a real love. Like, mm-hmm. I think nothing would make Blake happier than if Bigfoot was a real thing. Yeah. Is that how you approach it? Are you are there ones that you like? No, I'm pretty sure that, you know, Chupacabras are real. Or like, do you have one that you're like, no, I think that's real. Yeah, so I definitely approach it as as a skeptic, um, as an open minded skeptic. But I, um, so I, my major was marine bio, but then my minor was culture was uh, philosophy with a cultural anthropology focus. Mm-hmm. And I think that's what cryptozoology is. Cryptozoology is a combination of biology and anthropology. And um, you know, because these stories, whether or not the animal's real, the stories are important. 
and the stories are culturally important and significant and they're worth learning about because of that. So I definitely approached each each cryptid that I look at, I approach it as, you know, it's probably mistaken identity, but mm-hmm. if it isn't, let's look at, you know, what the facts are. What do we know about other animals that do this stuff? What do we know about the region? Could it support an animal like this? And, you know, I did have my mind changed on a few of them. I do think that Orang Pindek, the little Bigfoot in Sumatra, I think that it either is still there or was there very recently because all of the... that one. Yeah, it's it's like this. Um, I mean, it's the classic kind of hairy hominid, um, yeah. but but smaller, and uh, it's spotted all through Sumatra and some of the islands in Indonesia. And I got to meet with uh, Mike Morewood, Doctor Morewood, who's the guy who discovered Homo floresiensis, the Hobbit. Okay, and we know that they were there. It's a race of hominid that lived in mm-hmm. um, in Indonesia about ten thousand years ago. Yeah, and Mike said that he had evidence that he believes that they were there up until at least the 1920s. Oh, wow. Okay. So if you've got this, you know, preeminent, um, you know, I mean, this guy who found (laughs) the hobbits, he discovered them saying that they were there until the 1920s. I mean, I absolutely believe that. And then when you talk to a lot of the locals and they have these amazing stories about all the wildlife and they, you know, tigers are like these spiritual beings to them. And they have these great myths around tigers and everything else. But Orang Pendek, they just think of as, you know, it's it's not around too much, but it's just like a rat or any other animal. Like, it's just, it, it's yep. so commonplace to them that it's not like they would be making this up because there's no attention given to that. Like, I would ask them about Orang Pendek and they go, oh, yeah, you know, he stole some sugar from me. But let me tell you about this tiger. Like, <laughs> that's cool and all. But... Yeah. And uh, that, like us that with like just... deer, you know, like, yeah, yeah exactly. Like, sure. The thing almost hit my car. Uh... Yeah. Yeah. Oh, so I, I did have my mind changed. And then there was a few other ones that um, like sea serpents. I don't think that we will ever see the classic sea serpent. And that's kind of the problem with cryptozoology. I think that most likely it's mistaken identity for a few other animals, but there are undiscovered, you know, giant different species of squid. And I'm sure that we will find a new species of squid or a new species of shark. And nerds like me will be really, really excited. But yeah. most people will go, yeah, but it's not a sea serpent. I'm like, but what if it is? But it <laughs> is. I mean, the giant squid, they only got on video like within like the last five to 10 years. Yeah. 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 Like 2014, I think, or something was the first yeah. footage. Yeah, it's wild. And uh, I was actually, it was very serendipitous. I was, you know, kind of like poking around or whatever. And I saw an article today. I'm like, oh, my God, I have to ask Pat about this. I don't know if you saw it. the quote unquote Jurassic aged uh, giant bug that some guy found at Walmart. Did you see yeah. that? Yeah, yeah, I did see that. And it happened to be an entomologist that found it. Yeah, yeah. So weird. Yeah, well, I mean, most he brought it people, into like his high school class. Most other people wouldn't even look twice at it. They'd be like, oh, big bug, whatever. Yeah. Uh, yeah, but yeah, that I stuff didn't... happens a lot. Like that's, yeah. um, you know, I've, I've grown up in the Northeast and uh, Luna moths, you know, are mm-hmm. one of our biggest moth species. And I found maybe three of them. And then my daughter is super, super into moths. And she and I raise all different species of them. And, and we started going out and trying to find them and target them. And since then, I found like five or six. But, yeah. you know, these these big things are out there. It's just you don't you don't really see them too much or people aren't looking for them or don't know how to look for them. Yeah. Or just assume that, yep, that's just, you know, that, that, that rabbit is normal or, or the right. bug is normal, whatever. And if it was the right scientist on the right day, they'd be like, that's an un- unknown species, you know? Yeah. Yeah. It's I mean, they just, they found some new species of worm in like upstate New York last year or something. I mean, there's stuff like that has happening all the time. The, um, there was a, a Palus, uh, the Palus worm. I don't know if you've ever read about this thing. No. Out in like Idaho, um, there's something called the giant Palus earthworm. And there's all these legends about it that it's it's pale, you know, it's white, it smells like lilies, and it's supposed to spit at you when it's threatened. And the <laughs> okay. early settlers always talked about this. Um, yeah. but it hadn't been seen in like 75 years, and then they just found like the uh, a college field trip found the first specimen of it like two years ago and it, it is oh, really cool. pale it is really large um they don't know if it spits and they were like the smell lilies is a stretch but it does smell weird it, but there's always that weird. what is the there's some animal that smells like popcorn 
Oh, the Binturong. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, Bearcat. That thing's cool. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and and that's a, to me that's the the fascinating thing is it, it's the that kind of combination between like the fantasy of the unicorn and the narwhal. It, you know, is that the mistaken thing for it, or is it a rhino? And it, I don't know, just something about that just is more fascinating than if the unicorn was real like yeah to me, you know yeah, well the story the story is so great like so in in i was talking about cameroon and the central african republic i was there looking for a surviving dinosaur called mokele umbembe um i don't believe that there is i mean birds are surviving dinosaurs to all of the paleontologists out there i will recognize that <laughs> so, but there's not a dinosaur alive that your eight-year-old self would recognize as a dinosaur right now um right and how, well, but, how much is that is that we don't have the accurate representation of what a dinosaur looks like you know like talk to anyone also. about jurassic park and the velociraptors and you know, they get all like velociraptors should look like big turkeys or whatever. You know, <laughs> right, right? Yeah, they, they had big feathers and their beaks were yeah. yeah. And um, I mean, it's it's a great movie, regardless. No, oh, it's but, a fun movie, yeah. But um, yeah. So it, it it's that idea that um, the story, whether or not I never expected to find a dinosaur, we didn't find a dinosaur. I don't think that there is a dinosaur there, but it's still a phenomenal story, and it's still a great place to see, and it's it's great to see why this legend is important. And and in that instance, it's really like the the tribes out there. You know, to you have to be strong to survive. You have to be really strong, really tough, really brave. Like that, that is what's rewarded above all else. And if you say, I don't want to go down to the river at night because there are crocodiles down there, then people are going to think that you're weak and that they're going to make fun of you and you're not going to, you know, be respected in the tribe. But if there's a culturally accepted out of Mokele and Bembe, like, oh, no, I don't want to go down to the river at night because Mokele and Bembe is down there. And everyone's like, oh, good move. No, that's yeah, smart. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And it's just like that's that's accepted. I found the same thing in Brazil. Um, there's the legend of the Boto, which is a pink river dolphin that occasionally. Oh, yeah, I've heard of that. Yeah, he puts yeah. on a white he puts on a white suit and hat and he goes and impregnates a whole bunch of women at parties along the Amazon. <laughs> And um, actually, on the birth certificate in some regions of Amazonia, the father will be listed as Boto. No and kidding. the families totally accept that because, yeah. like, he's seductive. There's nothing you could have done. Like, I'm sure it wasn't your boyfriend. He seems like a really good guy, though. Maybe he'll raise the baby as if it and was And it gives his own. you that cultural out of... Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. That's, that's I love so those. funny. I love yeah. that story. You know, it's like that's... in America, we say that we're going to soak the dishes when we don't want to do the dishes. It's oh, I'm like, wait, that. how's that get you pregnant? What are we? <laughs> <laughs> everyone accepts it. Like, yeah. Oh, yeah. No, he's soaking the dishes. Yeah, yeah that's true. It, it's, it's those kind of uh, old wives tales that get you out of like having to do something. Yeah. Yeah. That's funny. So are you still actively making content in some way? Um, I focused on the books. So yeah. the books were kind of my um, my COVID project <laughs> um, and uh, getting them all edited, getting them out there. And then I've had a couple opportunities to, you know, m- potentially film some stuff. Wait, did there. you get all six books out since 2020? I did. I got I got all six books out in January and February. Oh, Jesus. Four were released in January and two in February. Stop being such an overachiever, right? It, it started as one book. <laughs> started right. as one book and um yeah it was uh it was way too long and the company that the um publisher was like yeah this is this is too much we should really we're gonna have to cut it back and i was like oh i know absolutely yeah let's talk about what to cut out and they were like actually do you think you could write some more <laughs> and we'll make it six books instead <laughs> <laughs> but um yeah so uh, other than that i haven't um i filmed a couple pilots here and there but it's it's very hit or miss i mean that's why it's not my full-time job yeah <laughs> because you go years in between filming stuff but i definitely i'd love to do it again yeah and, it, and i didn't realize that it wasn't your full-time so how do you how does that work with with your full-time job do you I be don't like sleep. hey i'm gonna take a hiatus <laughs> for six months while i go poop in mongolian you know death urinals and the um i've i've been very very lucky with both the production company that I that I work for and with my jobs um, and with my wife, who is extremely forgiving of all of this. <laughs> but it's been um, I've been able to use vacation 
and you know take time oh, off cool. and do so three episodes of legend hunter were filmed around um massachusetts okay so there was a, a couple week stretch where i would go into I, i'd go and um i'd get to the place where we were going to film mm-hmm. at about 5 a.m shoot for a couple hours then i'd go into work and i'd work until like six or seven and then i'd leave and go and film until like midnight or 1 a.m oh my god <laughs> so i did that for a few weeks and then um yeah that was that was pretty interesting and then other ones i would leave work early on a thursday like maybe take a half day on thursday and film until monday and then come into work at like noon on monday so i only had to take you know like two days like off a day and a half two days yeah, yeah. That's I, I love I love it it sucks that creative people have to work that way, but I love that they do work that way because it is that truest definition of like it's nice to get paid for what you're doing, especially when you can make a living at it, but I'm gonna do it anyways. You know, yeah. like if I didn't make any money podcasting, I'd when I wasn't making any money podcast podcasting, I still did it. And yeah. Yeah, because you know, it, it it's fun. I enjoy doing it. I don't. I'm not the kind of person who like. Oh, let's sit on the couch and watch Everybody Loves Raymond for the fiftieth time. You know, I want to go out and experience stuff and find cool new things and have those party slash bar stories where you know people are like, oh, you know, you know, what did you do today? And be like, oh, I spent twenty minutes on the phone talking to the CEO of Fluff because he heard our podcast and wanted to shoot the shit. Yeah. No, and it's, it's such awesome. a stupid thing. And people are like, really? You talk to the CEO of Fluff? I'm like, yeah, he was a super cool guy. <laughs> yeah. 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 When, when I was doing, uh, so Nature Calls was the name of my web series that I was doing, the the wildlife stuff. Yeah. And um, I got on Toucher and Rich in oh, Boston cool. yeah. because I was doing just this like DIY nature show. And they were like, what can go wrong with DIY? <laughs> can you bring some animals in here? And I was like, yeah, I can bring some animals in. <laughs> Did they <laughs> so, belong to you or? <laughs> no. No. <laughs> so. So I went up to Nerd, um, New England Reptile Distributors. Oh, I was going to say Stoneham Zoo. Like, where's our panda? Yeah, just let <laughs> stole some shit. No, I, I went to, um, I used to volunteer at Nerd. It's called yeah. New England Reptile Distributors. And they have just the coolest reptiles that you've ever seen. So Kevin is the guy that runs it. He's a friend of mine. And I said, hey, Kevin, Toucher and Rich asked if I can go on the show. Can I borrow some stuff to bring in? <laughs> He's like, yeah, take whatever you want. <laughs> so I filled my car. I had... I had an alligator. I had a 16 foot python. I had a um, an alligator snapping turtle, and then I had just a whole bunch of random like lizards and like water monitors. You know these these enormous uh, Indonesian water monitors and a whole bunch of other cool stuff. Yeah. And I was in an apartment in Winthrop, and I went up to Nerd and I bring all these animals out and I loaded them into my bathroom and shut the door <laughs> and kept the shower running most of the night to steam it up and keep it all hot. And you know, she was my girlfriend at the time, now my wife. And she would walk into the bathroom and there's just like a 16 foot snake hanging out there. She was like, I hope this is cool tomorrow. <laughs> so we went to Toucher and Rich and um, they had Adolfo take his shirt off and lay on the ground and have me put different animals on Adolfo. <laughs> I was like, all right. It, yeah, it, it's, it's, I love that stuff that, you know, you just, because who else gets to do that? Like, that's the way I look at it. You know, it's like, yeah, my life is weird, but. But it's fun. Yeah, it's fun. And I don't have dull stories at a, you know, at a cocktail party. I'm not talking about refinancing my house. I'm talking about, you know, the private tour I got of the Lizzie Borden house or, you know, like whatever happens to, you know. What did you think of that place? That was very cool. Yeah, it is cool. We were interviewing. Um one of the tour guides and and the two things that are noteworthy about it was. So we're sitting in the dining room at the dining room table and we have our recording equipment. I'm leaning on the table, whatever. And he's like, Oh, and this is the room where the autopsy was performed. And I'm like, Oh my God. And I like pull away from the table. He's like, no, 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 not on this table. I'm like, Oh, thank God. And then he goes that one over there that's hanging on the wall. I'm like, Oh, that's so disgusting. Yeah. And it's such a weird yeah. yeah. And then the craziest part was and again, I'm very skeptic and I understand like coincidences, but there are things that make you, you make you pause. Sure. Um yeah. my producer's computer crashed, we lost the episode. Oh man. Yeah. That's pretty like, weird. That's weird. Yeah. <laughs> I, I, I didn't convince me of anything, but I definitely 
I, I'll give you that it's weird, you know? Yeah. That's pretty cool. Yeah. I, I, we did a, we did an episode there as well. And um, one of the things that I loved is one of the guides said that, you know, people specifically request and the room that is booked the most is the one where her mom was murdered. Yeah. And she, they said that people will ask, like, as they're showing them the room and they're like, okay, here's where you're going to be sleeping. And they say, is it okay if I sleep on the floor where her body was found? Oh, like, that's weird. First of all, you don't have to ask us. Yeah, please don't like, tell me. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> like, sure, I guess, yeah. but. Oh, that's funny. Yeah. And I mean, it, it, I, I guess if you're seeking that out, like, yeah. There's just so many cool. You know, people always think about like, oh, you know, I learned about biology or history in in school and like yeah but you were given broad strokes the basics of what you need yeah and then just to go out and find out what else is out there um since you know i've moved to plymouth maybe 10 years ago and now podcasting with the old colony cast where we talk about plymouth and history and stuff there's a mass grave in plymouth i had no idea oh wow i didn't know that either yeah uh, i guess like a, a ship sunk in the harbor during the winter. So it's like one of those horrific, you know, the people on shore could hear the screams of the sailors as they perished, but they couldn't do anything because of the storm, whatever. So, yeah. So there's an unmarked unknown location, mass grave somewhere near burial Hill, man. But then at the same time, there was a doctor who lived adjacent to the cemetery that may or may not have been a body snatcher. And just it, it's so cool. Weird times, yeah. weird times. That that was your like that that was your job. Talk about you going to bar at night. <laughs> yeah. Oh, what did you do today? Well, I'm a body snatcher. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, technically, resurrection man. You know, right. let's get it right. <laughs> I'm actually trying to cure the town of the plague right now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and it, it's it's so just the stuff that we don't know is so fascinating. Oh, definitely. Yeah. yeah. I mean, so much is lost. I mean, histories, what are, what are the histories written by the victors or histories written by the the, the rulers, whatever. I mean, yeah, yeah. We, we lose a ton of what happened, especially in Massachusetts. I mean, you think yeah. about the, the history of everywhere in Massachusetts. I can go out in my woods and find, um, you know, clear evidence of stone um, foundations. Oh, the random stone walls and woods around here. Yeah. Oh, yeah. There's yeah. no records. There's no yeah. records of any house ever being back there. Um, so more than half of the victims of the Salem witch trials came from Andover. Oh, really? Yeah. So it's, 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 there's a right down the road from me, there's a place called Witch Hollow, which is where um, Rebecca Eames supposedly sold her soul to the devil when he was dre- when he looked like a black cult on this, uh, you know, this intersection that I cross through all the time. <laughs> Just like, it's crazy. It was yeah. right here. So it's like funny my in my head, like Andover wasn't close, you know, you know how like you, you know, like I know Andover's a town in Massachusetts, but like, I didn't realize it was close to Salem. It, I mean, it's pretty far, but it was all at the time. It was all one. It, it, I think oh, it was all right. Salem. Yeah. They just right. considered it like, and then if you lived more than a certain distance from the church, like if it would take you more than a day to get to church, then they would then separate you out and you get another. Yeah. Yeah. That's funny. It's such a, such a weird, weird place. Cause it's, it's so much older than like, if you go to California, talk to people like they're like, yeah, we don't have basements. We don't have, you know, the antique stores like you guys have. Cause they're just, you know, littered around here. Yeah. But it, it's, and we're so packed in tight, you know, like I was oh, yeah. talking to a buddy of mine when he, first got out of college moved out to chicago and i think he was paying the same for his apartment in chicago that i was paying for my apartment in east bridgewater and i'm like how is that and he's like oh because there's plenty of room around chicago to put more houses yeah Yeah. and there's not around here no (laughs) um so sorry uh, my first apartment in boston was um was in back bay yeah. And you say that to people and they're like, oh, wow, back bay. I'm like, no, no, no. I was down a back alley <laughs> and it was a two car garage that they put up some plywood in the middle and made it into two apartments. And the dude oh, next nice. to me was uh, some type of Baptist minister who used to like flagellate himself at night. Oh, my God. <laughs> yeah. 
<laughs> he knock on the wall and be like, keep it down. Oh, it was so weird. Amen. It was, it was, people would throw garbage out the windows and fill the alleyway. I'd have to wade through garbage on on uh, on garbage day. And uh, one night I'm laying in bed. So this is, you know, like the apartment, you could touch both walls. Yeah. Like you could stand there and touch both walls. If you were in the bathroom, like sitting on the toilet, you had to open the door because your knees stuck out. Yeah. And I'm laying in bed one night and a hand just punched through my screen <laughs> in the one window <laughs> I had. I started feeling around like this. I was just like, I got to get out of here. Oh I'm my done God, with that's it. crazy. Yeah, that was my so apartments in Boston. Yeah. 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 Uh, so do you have plans for like, do, are you working on some sort of um, video thing now? Like, do you have something in mind that you want to do? Like, what's yeah, next? I mean, there's, there's always new, uh, there's always new series. Like I'm, I'm open to it. Um, I have two, I have a, a eight and a four year old right now, which makes it a little bit. So you're busy. To, yep. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But I'm always looking for new, uh, new adventures. What I'd really love to do now is kind of uh, the, the one special a year type thing. Mm-hmm. Like it would be very hard for me to film a series at this point. Um, yeah. I'm a little bit older. My kids are there and just uh with with all the travel restrictions and everything it would be a little bit tougher so one series or one special a year i'd love to do and i plan on keeping uh, to keep on writing and i have a trip that i've been working on and i'm kind of developing just to write about it oh that's cool and that's what i yeah so that that i can kind of do on my own it doesn't involve as many meetings and as much kind of overhead and everything else too many people involved um so we'll see that's cool man um where can our listeners go to buy your book find out more about your book keep tabs on you know where where, the strange places you're peeing so um instagram is just about the only social media that i'm active on okay um so instagram is pat spain my website is patspain.com and the books can be from any bookstore they can uh, that they can order them or uh, amazon it's um, they're released by Sixth Books is the imprint from John Hunt Publishing. I'm kind of learning all of this world of what publishers are like. But um, yeah, they're they're uh, available. Amazon seems to be the one that people go to the most to get them. But any bookstore can order. them. Oh, very cool. Uh, so that kind of ties it up. I feel like this flew by. Um, <laughs> no, this is awesome, we're, man. We're definitely going to have to have you back on because that was that was just too much fun. I would um, love to. Plus, I love talking weird science, biology stuff. Um, I don't have a educational background. It's just, I find it fascinating. Um, Same. And uh, so, so listeners uh, make sure you go check out Pat's stuff. Uh, we'll catch you guys next week. And uh, that's, that's pretty much it, man. Like, I don't, this is really I don't, cool. I don't Thank have a catchy, much. like out, no. outro. I, I feel like I need one. Yeah. What was the, uh, what's the anchor man thing? <laughs> stay classy. Oh, stay Andy. classy. <laughs> yeah. Stay classy. Creative people. <laughs> awesome well thank you so much no problem cool and thanks for checking out the show today listeners uh if you enjoyed the content today you can go over to patreon.com slash inebriart to support the show you can join over there for just a few dollars a month and help us provide this fun content that you just checked out you can also email us at inebriart.com with your questions complaints and concerns or you can find us on all social medias at inebriart or at inebriart6 on instagram And also don't forget to check out our other shows, Bar Talk Podcast, Old Colony Cast, Inebriart, and all the other shows on the Inebriart Network, which you can find at inebriart.com. Thanks again for listening.